18 people, Craig Wolf. Okay, Hello. so um, we're going to start this uh, field report soon. Um, I guess we'll just wait a few minutes for people to be able to um, to uh, log in and get it working. Um, I'm just going to switch that there, so you can presumably see my uh, my mouse pointer moving around a little bit. Um, so yeah, we'll just wait another 30 seconds or so before we make a start. There's a few slides at the beginning that's not uh, as thrilling as the later ones, so uh, so you'll be able to uh, maybe we'll pick up a few people uh, during that time. Yeah, so this is a. a, a Hopefully, we'll be able to do a lot more of these kinds of live um, events. Uh, once I figure out how this software works, I've got some great help here. Uh, uh, Aaron, who's a super tech guy for the whole city, he, he does anything that's got a cable coming out of it, Aaron deals with it. Uh, he's, he's set this up, so hopefully we should have the report and we'll have a live video part at the end um, with a roaming camera so we can move around and uh, do that too. So it's all, all very technical. Okay, uh, I've got it about two minutes past six, so I think um, maybe we'll make a start. Um, okay, so, uh, well, welcome to the fourth annual field report. Usually I give this in a room full of people, um, but because of COVID, we're not doing that this year, obviously. So I always kind of wanted to stream these anyway. So this is a, an attempt at, at, uh, at that. So before I start, I just want to say uh, this is a free event, so this please consider donating at Dickinson Museum. Someone says there's no sound. We have a, a donations sense. page, um, and um, yeah, we, we we are a very efficient organization. We don't actually spend an awful lot on our field work, um, but we you'll see that we've got some really great things to talk about. So uh, yeah, please consider donating. Okay, so a little outline about what's going to be right. going on. Hold on, Denver. Keep introing. We're not ready yet. There might be a sound problem. There might be a sound problem. I've got the sound coming through pretty good. Oh, it's working on my phone. Sorry. Oh, it's working. Sorry, I, I heard there might be a sound problem. Okay, so a um, little outline about what we're going to do. First of all, we do a little introduction. Uh, the first uh, little short section is going to be on museum news, uh, some of the things that are going on here. Uh, some about displays. Then we'll talk about the field work, the new discoveries, and then that's probably going to take about 45 minutes. And then we're going to switch over to our live camera. We're going to answer some of the questions that you've got and uh, maybe show off some of the fossils. Uh, we'll see if we can make that work. Uh, obviously, this year we've had some COVID limitations at the museum. The museum was closed uh, for a, a month or two, um, and we closed our hands on exhibits. Uh, our lab space, we couldn't have volunteers in the lab, and we had to adapt some of our public programming. Uh, how that affected our field work is that um, I wanted to have 10 people on my crew all summer so that we could get a lot more done. Um, but once COVID hit, um, we were very fortunate that we were able to do field work. Uh, we were effectively uh, basically staying in a field um, miles away from anybody else. Um, oh, I hear it on my know. phone. Once a week, we, we went to went to buy groceries uh, but other than that we didn't have any communications with people so um sorry we're apparently having a few audio problems it's picking up fine some people say it's only coming out of the left speaker yes okay so it's only coming out of the left speaker which um, is okay i mean I guess we'll have to make do with just the left speaker on this. Um, uh, if you can make do with that for the live stream, um, we should be able to mirror those for the um, for the recorded version. Okay, well, I'm sorry about that. Um, well, yes, yeah, so we had limited crew size, uh, so that's one of the things that we had. So I, I, I didn't try and fill up my crew. So sometimes we had five people, sometimes we had um, uh, eight people, something like that. And I know what the problem is with, with the sound. It, it can't be fixed at the moment. Okay, so a few of the people that we have here in Paleo. Um, there's me, Dr. Denver Fowler. I'm the curator here. I started in 2016. 
Uh, there's my wife, Dr. Liz Friedman Fowler. She's uh, going to be talking a bit about hadrosaurs, and you'll see her on camera in a bit. And then Dara Steffens, our preparator, and she's been here since 2019. And one of my tasks here at the museum, I was set when I got here, is to make Badlands Dinosaur Museum into a world-class museum. Um, and that's obviously quite a big task. Um, I hope that, at least from the fieldwork perspective, as you'll soon see, we started to really pick up some world-class specimens, um, which, which would be welcomed in any museum anywhere in the world. Uh, also, we have our summer intern. This year, Julia Anderson joined us from California, and she was working with, obviously, a very difficult situation with COVID. Uh, usually, our summer intern runs all sorts of summer programs for families. Uh, Julia did a really good job uh, with social distancing and everything being cleaned off after it was touched, all that kind of thing, and uh, had some really good programming. So, uh, thank you very much to Julia. Um, okay, so what's been going on in the museum? Well, uh, there's a few things. Uh, we've got an electric car charger that was uh, partly, uh, mostly funded by the Lignite Energy Council. Uh, so we now have the ability for visitors to charge their car while they visit, um, which is a free charger as well. Um, we had a security overhaul at the museum. I couldn't find a very good photograph to have of this, but uh, on that wall behind the Triceratops skull, there's a whole new camera system. Um, my director and, and Aaron tell me that I can't have a, like an electro current to uh, give people shocks if they try and touch the fossils. Uh, but you can shout through these cameras. You can make sound come through them, so that's quite cool. Um, so that's uh, obviously a, a great thing, great step forward for the museum. We've also had delivery of about 400 fossil storage cabinets. Um, we got these from the USGS. So um, hopefully we'll be able to build some new storage space, and then we'll have one of the largest um, repository spaces for fossils uh, in the region, um, which is a really big step forward. Um, hopefully we can get that done, but we have the cabinets now. Uh, in the prep lab, there's a few things. Um, I promise you that's Dara on the left hiding behind one of our new pieces of equipment. We have a, a big, uh, sorry, big microscope um, on an arm that we got so that we can prepare some of the specimens that we've collected this summer. Um, and also in the prep lab at the moment, you can see this great big triceratops frill. This is being got ready for display. This is a specimen we collected in 2016 called uh, Count Tricula. And it's actually a really large uh, triceratops from the lower parts of the Middle Health Creek. Um, so those are some things that are being cleaned up in the lab right now. Um, in April, we also ran a uh, another live stream event. We were practicing this kind of thing, dinosaur decapitation. We cut the head off one of our uh, mounts. So this is a picture of a Thescalosaurus that's been on display since 1992. Uh, Liz used a Dremel to chop the head off of this thing. And uh, we replaced it with that picture at the bottom. Uh, this is a more accurate skull of a Thescalosaurus. Uh, we removed the old skull, which was a, uh, an old Hypsilophidan head and had the wrong head for 80 years of this dinosaur. Um, so I'm busy putting some new panels together for that right now. Uh, in 2020, we had some new research published. So uh, in January, uh, Matt Ely's and me uh, published a paper on Larry the Triceratops. This has been an exhibit in the museum uh, since 1992. Um, and when we were cleaning it, we noticed that a bunch of the tail vertebrae were actually fused together. So Larry had had an accident at some point in his life and broken his tail. So we published a paper on that in January. And uh, we altered the exhibit so that it has a kink in his tail. Um, and in June, June uh, myself and Liz published a paper describing two new horned dinosaurs from New Mexico. So this is Navajo Ceratops and Termino Carvus, uh, with a reconstruction by Veal Sinkonen. Um, if you've been in the museum in the last couple of years, you'll have seen this model. Um, this was described as a new species. So we have a few bones of this here in the museum. And this year we described it as a new species called Triracuncus prairiensis. This is an Alvarez saurid dinosaur with um, a huge claw in its hand. And so we actually named this animal after that claw. Triracuncus prairiensis means Captain Hook of the Prairie. So named after uh, the famous hook-handed pirate. Um, so that model that's at the museum is of this tree rockuncus, and it's uh, now got a name. Um, just recently, in November, I published a paper describing um, the rocks of the Hell Creek Formation. Um, so this is actually a formation all across um, the northern Great Plains area. Um, I was describing it in Montana, but it also occurs here in North Dakota. So hopefully... Knowing about these different layers of rock and how they line up will help us line up the North Dakota rocks with the ones in Montana. 
so we can start to have a much better idea about um, the Hell Creek formation of this region. And this, the Hell Creek formation contains dinosaurs from the very end of the age of dinosaurs. And we have a number of those dinosaurs on display here in our museum. Um, so on to the fieldwork part then. Um, like I say, we do fieldwork in two different formations at the moment. We do fieldwork in the Hell Creek formation. Um, so that's uh, 66 uh, million years old. Uh, but most of what I'm going to be talking about today is from the Judith River Formation. So that's from about 78 to 76 million years ago. Um, this photograph is of the Judith River, but it's not from this year. Um, I put this in because of a slightly sentimental reason. This is my old field truck. And um, we usually do field work from mid-June to end August. And on the way out to our field area, my old field truck uh, decided it was going to blow its engine up when we were almost at our, at our location. So, um, so I had to get a new truck. So that was right at the very beginning of the field season. One of my trucks blew up. And then I got a kidney stone as well. So that was, it was a brilliant first, first few weeks of the season. I tell you, I, I had a great time. Um, but once we got going, uh, we did some really great stuff. So uh, the length of our field season is typically about two and a half months. And that does depend on how much funding we have. Um, although we're pretty cheap. Like I say, we just camp in a field. It's pretty rough. And uh, everything we do is on public land. So um, we're not spending millions of dollars buying dinosaurs for our museum. Um, we basically, uh, we collect from public lands with our partners at the Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Reclamation. And so the sites that you're going to see in the forthcoming slides are all from public lands from the BLM or Bureau of Reclamation. So Judith River Formation is where we did most of our work this year. This is what I'm going to be talking about in, in this presentation. So 78 million years ago, this is what North America looked like. There was a shallow seaway called the Western Interior Seaway um, that had flooded the central states of the United States. Um, and you can see just about here, uh, this is Montana. And you can see that Montana was on the coast. And this seaway, sea level would rise, sea level would fall, and you would have deltas building out into the seaway periodically uh, over a few million years. And on top of those delta, is where many dinosaurs lived. And those are the dinosaurs that we are collecting. Um, so this is a map showing you the, where the Judith River occurs in Montana. So the Judith River is purple. And we worked all across the Judith River. So all the way from the western side to the eastern side. And we even started doing a little bit of work down in what's labeled as the type area uh, in the southern exposures of the Judith River. And we were there. <coughs> um, um, we had some people there just a couple of months ago. Um, so this is what the Judith River looks like. Um, typically what we do is um, we'll find a bunch of new sites and um, we'll collect surface collecting from those. We have a surface collecting permit from the BLM. And then if we find a site that's really promising, we'll apply for an excavation permit. So the following year, um, we can go and dig a much bigger hole. So what I'm going to be talking about is a mixture of new sites where we're collecting things from the surface, and then you'll see we're digging in in sites where we've got an uh, excavation permit. So some of our sites from 2019, Liz had a rather good year. Um, she found two Centrosaurus sites. Uh, this first one is called Liz Centro 2. Um, now this was um, quite well preserved. The bone has got quite nice surfaces. It's, it's very nicely preserved, but it's very broken up as well. Um, so we collected a few bits off the surface last year, and we got an excavation permit, and we went back this year. So we dug in, and um, here you can see the excavation. One of the interesting things about this site is these cliffs that you can see behind are just a few meters higher up in the cliff than the site that we're digging. And these are rocks. Um, it's all Judith River formation, but they're very, very similar to the rocks that we get up in Canada called the Dinosaur Park Formation. Um, so if we were in Canada, we'd give these rocks a different name. Where we're digging would be called the Old Man Formation, and this bit of rock up here would be called the Dinosaur Park Formation. So we're right at the boundary of those two formations, and that actually tells us something about the dinosaurs that we find as well. Well, when we were digging this year, we didn't find all that much in the way of new material at this site. We found a few more scraps, and they went with what we'd got before. Um, so most of what we have is um, things that have been cleaned up from previous years, but as you can see, um, this is a bit of puzzling that we did uh, this year, and I've managed to piece together um, basically a whole parietal of um, this specimen from this site, Liz Centro 2. And this is the most diagnostic bone of 
uh, this particular kind of dinosaur. This tells us that it is a Centrosaurus apertus. So Centrosaurus was one of these horned dinosaurs called Ceratopsids, um, and it had a number of spikes on its frill. Um, there's one of them labeled here, and then this, uh, this old diagram here shows you a complete frill um, from, a, from when Centrosaurus was first described. Um, yeah, so we were able to confirm this is Centrosaurus apertus. And that's actually really important um, because uh, we also have the nose horn of this, this animal and we've also got part of the squamosal as well. So that's the edge of the frill. So the little diagram in the bottom right shows you that we've got basically most of the frill of this thing and we've got the nose horn and um, parts of the beak area as well. Um, that might not look like too much, but these are actually the best bits to have because the nose horn and the frill shape evolve so rapidly in these horned dinosaurs, they change uh, over as little as uh, 200,000 years and possibly less. So by having those parts of the frill, we can tell that we've got Centrosaurus apertus. And the cool thing about that is that Centrosaurus apertus only occurs um, in a very narrow period of time. So we can line up this particular layer of rock with the lower part of the dinosaur park formation in, the, in central Alberta, um, which is really helpful. We're starting to get a regional idea of um, the dinosaurs. So a second site that we worked this year were, that was found last year was Centrosaurus puzzle eye. So these are the pieces we picked off the surface last year. Um, may not look too glorious, but uh, there's the eye horns. There we go. So these are the two eye horns just above the eyes. They're actually really nice. Uh, they're very well preserved. We have part of the nose horn and then we have this jugal. This is the cheek area and then the space where the eye would be. So we've got sort of the central part of this skull, almost the opposite of what we found in the other one, Liz Centro 2. Uh, we think this is a Centrosaurus as well, based on the eye horns. Well, we went back there in 2020 and uh, we dug in, so you can see the excavation there. Um, and we started finding some bones. Um, there weren't huge amounts of bones, um, but there were a number of them. Uh, so this is a we found a couple of ribs. This one here was about 80% complete. Brian uh, had, a, had a good time digging that one up. We haven't cleaned it up yet. Um, and we started finding some more skull bones. So we have a few pieces of the frill. Um, and then this on the right here is a quadrate, we think. Um, so that's part of the joint uh, between the upper and the lower jaw. Um, and then the brain case. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, this is actually the brain case. It looks to be in really good condition from what we saw in the field. Um, it's sort of separated out from the rest of the skull. So this is John uh, excavating it right here. We haven't cleaned this up yet, um, but it's very promising, I think. And um, I have a colleague down in St. Louis, uh, Dr. Ashley Moorhart, who works on the brains of dinosaurs. And um, she's interested in scanning brain cases. So maybe she'd be interested in this one when we get it cleaned up. I'm hopeful that you'll be able to uh, basically see the shape of the dinosaur's brain if we cat scan this. Um, and it's a nice small size, so you can fit it inside a CAT scanner. That's often one of the problems with uh, dinosaurs. If you want to scan the skull, you've got to get a really big scanner to fit the whole skull into, especially these big horn dinosaurs. So when you find a brain case on its own like this, it can be really useful. Um, so yeah, we found uh, a few more pieces of the frill, um, quite fragmentary. Uh, we've got that beautiful brain case and some more parts of the nose area. Um, but generally speaking, not too much of this one. Um, we kind of got the opposite of the other Centrosaur, so we could put them both together and make a complete skull, maybe. Um, we did find some other things at this site, which are pretty cool. Um, there's a little uh, tooth that came with it. So this could be a raptor tooth because it's very small. Uh, the serrations that you can see on the left-hand side, just here, these are serrations of the tooth. Um, they... They tend to be quite pointed in raptors. I haven't quite looked at this properly yet, so I'm not sure if it's a raptor or just a small tyrannosaur. But this is probably a, a shed tooth. So this is a tooth that was lost by a carnivorous dinosaur while it was feeding on, um, feeding on the carcass of this horned dinosaur. And something else that we get a lot of at this site um, is we get lots and lots of snails and clams. So you can see there's at least three different species of snail that we have on the left-hand side. And, and this is by no means all the snails we collected. We, we have enough snails to build another museum out of, believe me. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see lots of clams. And that little black shape on the top of the right-hand side, that's a seed. So there's all sorts of fossils found in association with this um, Centrosaurus, suggesting that after it died, at least, it was basically falling apart in this sort of shallow pond, uh, pond deposit. 
Um, so another thing we did, uh, we prospect for new sites. Um, I'm kind of giving this in order of, of what we did. So we start off with some of our smaller projects and the bigger projects come at the end. Uh, this is a really cool mushroom rock uh, where some cliff swallows have built their nest underneath. I didn't dare get much closer because it, it, it's very narrow waist. It, it probably doesn't have very long, but it's still going to be up like that. But it was really cool to find. Um, we had some real luck this year finding the bones of horned dinosaurs. So not just those two Centrosaurus sites. Uh, when we were prospecting, we found some new horned dinosaur sites. So these are a couple of isolated bones. The squamosal on the left. This is the edge of the frill of a small horned dinosaur, probably a Centrosaurus. On the right-hand side, we've got a lower jaw of another small one. These are not full-sized by any stretch of the imagination. These ones are both about half, one-third to one-half grown. Um, so that's a lower jaw of a Centrosaurus. This one is really cute. This is an eye horn from a uh, baby Chasmosaurus, we think. Um, so uh, the eye would go about here. You can see my mouse pointer. This is where the eye would be. And then um, this is obviously the little horn. This is a, on the right-hand side, you can see a photograph of what was a complete um, baby Chasmosaurus or almost complete baby Chasmosaurus found in Canada. Um, probably a little bit younger than ours, given the fact that it only has a very short brow horn above the eye, and ours has a little bit longer and it's a bit larger. Um, as far as I'm aware, there actually isn't um, a growth stage of Chasmosaurus known that has this sort of size horn, uh, if this is a Chasmosaurus. So this is a pretty cool specimen. It's only on its own. It's only a horn on its own. Um, so it's not a partial skull or anything, but uh, it's pretty cool to find. However, um, this is a site from 2018 called Jack's Horn. You might have seen this on some of our social media. On the left-hand side is a horn that Jack found in 2018, Jack Wilson, one of my field crew. Um, and it is really cool. It's from a small, um, probably a chasmosaurine, again, one of these long-horned uh, ceratopsid horned dinosaurs. So we went back to this site this year to see if any new parts had fallen out. We didn't know where it was coming from. It was at the bottom of a cliff. It was quite difficult to uh, to see where it might be coming out. Well, on the right-hand side, you can see one of the things that we found this year. This is the beak. Um, we found this lying at the bottom of the cliff as well. So this thing is falling out somewhere. Um, so we, we rummaged around in some of the um, loose rock at the bottom of this cliff, and we found some more parts of this little Chasmosaurus. So... Um, there's no parts of the frill, but we have the beak, we have part of the lower jaw, we have tooth sections from the lower jaw, we have some parts of what we think are the backs of the nose area, and then we have the tip of both of the brow horns. So this thing looks like it's probably coming out, if it's all together, it's coming out face first and falling down the cliff. It's a really difficult site to work. Um, we're hoping to be able to excavate it in next year, next summer. Um, it's very dusty, it's very steep, and uh, I'm sure the field crew will attest it. Uh, <laughs> you want to make sure there's nobody at the bottom of the cliff when there's someone standing at the top part looking at where this thing is probably coming out. But I think we've figured out where it's coming out now. So um, really promising site to work for next year. As I say, there are not many of these young horned dinosaurs, so we're really looking forward to dig this one. Um, we found about 20 new sites called microsites this year, and we went back to about 19 old microsites we found. So this is kind of what a microsite looks like. There's lots of uh, bits of rock and gravel, and every now and then you find a very small fossil. Uh, and microsites are really cool because they can tell you about the whole fauna, all the different animals that lived in this area at the time. So this is rather obviously a tyrannosaur tooth, and uh, here's our mandatory tyrannosaur tooth slide. We find a lot of Tyrannosaur teeth like this. Uh, sometimes they're on their own. Sometimes they're part of microsites. Um, this one on the left was just sticking out of the cliff. Jack found it on the top of a hill. So there's Jack in the background. And then a number of other big and small teeth. Uh, this one here in the bottom left. This one's really cool. It's got a wear facet. So when this Tyrannosaur was biting through hard bones, it worn away uh, the, the top of the tooth. Um, it's not just Tyrannosaurs you find, um, they're probably one of the least interesting things that you find in these sites. Uh, they tell you all about the different animals. So here's a couple more Tyrannosaur teeth. And then below this, these are raptor teeth. So these are the teeth of small dromaeosaurid um, dinosaurs. This one's probably called Sauronothelestes, so a little raptor. Not very big, only a couple of meters long. Um, this is a claw from probably another raptor dinosaur. In the top right... 
uh, this is really cool. It just looks like a blob. And that's what it looked like when it was in the field, too. But this is actually an armor stud from the arm of a, a type of armored turtle, I think, a basil emis. Um, so they have uh, these these spikes on their forelimbs. Um, so this is one of those. It's pretty cool. Bottom right corner, these are some salamander uh, vertebrae. So there were salamanders living in this area um, at the time. And then the bottom left, um, I'm not quite sure what this is. This is a either a femur or a humerus. Liz could probably tell me. What is this, Liz? Humerus. Is that frog or is that mammal? Oh, Liz would have said turtle. So there you go. I, I'm not. I'm not very good at the microphone, but it's Liz is Liz is the microphone expert. Um, and then in the bottom right of that image, this is actually a really cool. It just looks like one little vertebra, and it is. Um, but this is either a lizard or a snake, and their vertebrae are actually very rare. So uh, that's a really cool thing to find. So all these microfossils, and we have hundreds and hundreds of these um, from these different sites that we collected, if not thousands probably, um, from this summer. Um, some of which are being worked on by some different researchers. Um, also, at some of these microfossil sites, we started to find some dinosaur eggshell. So eggshell of dinosaurs tends to have these pimples, so it looks a bit like the surface of a basketball. So these are some dinosaur eggshell fragments. Um, I expect these are going to be eggshells from either duckbills or carnivorous dinosaurs called theropods. Um, we're not sure yet. We don't have many pieces. Um, and so maybe this suggests there's some nesting sites nearby, um, but quite promising. I was quite excited to find these. Actually, I think Jack found all of those, but uh, I definitely found one piece of eggshell this summer, just not one of these three. Um, we find other cool stuff. There's a little lizard jaw there in the top left. You can see the little teeth sticking out of the lizard's jaw. In the bottom left, this is, a we think, part of a bird jaw. Uh, this is something that Jack found. Um, I don't know if it's a bird jaw or not. I don't know that much about them. Um, but just an example of bird bones are always really rare. So an example of another of the cool things you can get at these microsites. And then sometimes we get larger pieces of bone at these sites. And this one we collected because it has this tooth mark. This is where a tyrannosaur has been eating this bone. This was a um, fibula of a duckbill. So that's a lower shin bone of a duckbill dinosaur. Um, and presumably a tyrannosaur was eating the meat off the legs of this duckbill and scraped its tooth against the bone as it scraped the last of the meat from the bone. So we have a few bones like that with uh, tooth marks on them. Uh, this is something I'm really excited about, actually. We haven't cleaned this up yet. It's very, very delicate. But this is probably the brain case of a small reptile, I think. Um, this is a photograph of it from the field. Uh, we think that this is what's called the frontals. So that's kind of like the area between the eyes. And then at the back here is what's called the parietal. So this is basically the area over the top of the brain of whatever this animal is. And uh, this was kind of the left side of the photograph here. This was the edge of the cliff. So some of the pieces had fallen down, and that's what you can see here. There's a few more pieces, but this might be the area around the eye. Um, so this is actually a really cool thing to find. I don't know what it is. Um, I hope it's not a fish. It really doesn't look like a fish. It's too sturdy for that. Um, so whatever it is, it's going to be a really cool specimen, uh, potentially rather important, depending on what species it is. So we need to get that cleaned up and figure out what it is we're looking at. But I'm, I'm quite excited about that one. Um, oh. In the area of the Judith, one of the areas where we worked, we found that Centrosaurus apertus skull. So that allows us to say that these rocks are about 76 million years old. Another of the areas of the Judith that we worked further east, um, we don't have any indications of how old the rocks are. So this year we did a little bit of prospecting in the Bearpaw Shale. This is a marine unit which lies over the top of the Judith River Formation. And usually when you're looking in these marine units, uh, these were rocks that were laid down at the bottom of an ancient sea. So we find the fossils of sea creatures in them. And we went in there looking for fossils like the one in the top right. So this is a baculite ammonite. Um, ammonites, most ammonites you're probably familiar with, have these spiral shells. And they're a kind of squid-like animal that lives in a spiral shell. Baculites actually have a straight shell, so that's why this one looks straight. Uh, but we were looking for ammonites of any kind, because ammonites evolved so rapidly in just a few hundred thousand years that if you find um, one of the what we call diagnostic species, 
you can date the rock to just within a few hundred thousand years. So the idea is that if we find ammonites from just above the rocks where our dinosaurs come from, then we'll be able to figure out um, the, the, the maximum age of the, um, of the dinosaurs that we find. Now we've found a few ammonites, we haven't had them dated yet, um, but that's going to give the first clue as to what age the, the Judith River dinosaurs are. Um, while we were looking for these ammonites, um, Steve, one of my field crew, found a mosasaur. So this is a little bit of that mosasaur. This is the snout, uh, the tip of the snout of the mosasaur. You're kind of looking up onto its upper jaw. So these are some of the front teeth. Um, and then there would have been many more um, teeth further back. Um, unfortunately, this thing had what we call blown out a number of years ago. So we've got some more parts of the jaw and some vertebrae. Uh, but it was pretty cool to see. Um, there might be some more of it there. We'll probably have a little dig around uh, next year and see if we can find some better parts of the skull. Uh, we have the brain case of this as well, actually. It looks quite cool. Um, but uh, we found that bit of a mosasaur. Okay, so I'm going to hand you over to Liz at the moment. So this is the first of our big digs. So I'm going to talk about three of the big digs. So this is the big projects that we did um, for the rest of the summer. So this first one is called the Bighorn Bone Bed. I'm just going to talk about the first couple of slides. Um, it's called the Bighorn Bone Bed because in 2017 I found this. This is a brow horn from a horned dinosaur. Um, and I was really excited because there was loads of bones coming out with this brow horn. I thought, oh my god, we have found a bone bed of horned dinosaurs. And horned dinosaurs from the Judith River Formation are pretty rare. Um, it's not a Centrosaurus because those don't have big brow horns like like this one. So that meant it was either something like Ceratops, a very rare, we don't really know what Ceratops is, a very rare dinosaur, or maybe it was something like Avaceratops or a Chasmosaurine. I was super excited to dig into this bone bed some more. So we went there last year and dug in and every single bone that we found was from a duck bill. So that's why Lizzie looks really pleased in this picture because she works on duck bills and she's going to tell you about the site. Uh, and so she has many duckbill bones to work on, and I don't have any horned dinosaurs from this side at all. So I'll hand you over to Liz. Hello. Yeah, so this is a bighorn bone bed. It's an awesome bone bed of duckbill dinosaurs. Um, and it's, it's just really rich with bones, but luckily they're spaced out just enough that we can collect them pretty easily. Uh, so you can see some of the jackets that we've made here. Um, so they're not huge. Uh, you don't want a mouse. I know. Where, which, where is my mouse pointing? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so you can see the size of the bones um, is generally like we have a huge size range. Some of them are juveniles and they're really tiny and then we've got some big ones. But fortunately, they're spaced out enough. We can make nice little easy to carry jackets. So we find all these different bones and then wrap up uh, the bones in the jackets. So when we came back this year, we really opened up the quarry a lot more and, and spent more time here. So last year we got 82 bones and this year we collected 178 new bones. So we've got 280 different bones from this bone bed so far. There's many different individuals in here of, of varying sizes, but they all seem to be duckbill dinosaurs. Like Denver said, <laughs> we just haven't found any more ceratopsy and stuff yet. Uh, so we find parts of pretty much the whole body here. We got a lot of the limb bones, arms, legs, uh, quite a lot of hand and foot bones as well. Um, and this summer we hit a patch that was just full of these tail vertebrae. And so we were finding about 10 different tail vertebrae every day, just really cute little ones from the tip of the tail. Um, some ribs, not as many as you have in, in some bone beds, which is nice because ribs are not the most exciting of the bones. So uh, we're happy to have a lot more of the, the arms and legs and skull uh, represented here. Not a huge amount of the pelvis yet. We have a few pieces. Uh, here's one of the jaw bones that's just really adorable. I mean, that's Denver's hand, and he has a pretty big hand. But this is still a, a fairly small jawbone of a juvenile. Um, 
So this is a small duck-billed dinosaur, and the teeth are just coming out here. So most of the other teeth that it was actually using for chewing, those ones got loose and fell out. So the teeth would be sticking out more visibly when the animal's alive, and it would form this big flat grinding surface. Um, but those little worn teeth tend to fall out pretty easily. Um, but this is quite a small individual. This, this is a little guy, um, you know, maybe one year old, maybe less. We don't know yet for sure. Uh, so that was the upper jaw, the maxilla. This is the lower jaw here. Okay, and so all of these ridges, these are the tooth rows. And so every single one of these ridges would have a set of three or four teeth all stacked up. And the chewing surface is on the top here. And as those teeth get worn down, there's always fresh teeth to replace them. So these guys were really well adapted for eating a lot of tough plant material. Um, here's another nice skull bone here. This is part of, uh, this is a post-orbital. So this is right behind the eye. So that's the eye socket there. And that's right behind the eye. And then that's another hole in the side of the skull. Um, but really, really nicely preserved material. Uh, these are some pieces of the brain case. So these are the bones that, that surround the brain on the top of the head. Um, so these are the frontal bones. And we're showing the bottom side here. So you can see this, these little oval shiny areas. This is where the brain would be located, or at least you know one of the lobes of the brain would be down here. So this is what the duckbill dinosaur probably looked like. Um, pretty much all, I mean, all the bones we have seem to be consistent with it just being one species of duckbill dinosaur. We don't think we have multiple different species. Um, and so the skull bones that we have, they seem to show that it's from uh, a Brachylophosaurus or something super closely related to Brachylophosaurus. We haven't pinned down exactly which species yet, um, but it's definitely in the Brachylophosaur group. Um, and so we've got at least four different individuals that we've collected so far from those small juveniles uh, up to large adults and everything in between. Um, I think it's going to turn out there's going to be a lot more than four individuals as we collect more bones and Dara preps more bones. Um, that number is just going to keep going up. We have quite the size range. Uh, so even though all the big bones are from duckbill dinosaurs, we do get some cool small pieces. Um, so here's a little uh, claw from a raptor. Uh, whoops, go back up. Um, so very nicely curved little claw, very slender, uh, missing a bit of the base here, but pretty complete to the tip. Really, that was a fun little find because most of what we find are so many Tyrannosaur teeth. Like we almost get sick of finding them. Um, not really, but we always laugh when we find another Tyrannosaur tooth. Uh, we were popping out several a day of these guys and really generally pretty big ones. Uh, a lot of them very wide and fat um, from, from pretty big tyrannosaurs for the Judith River formation. Because uh, remember, this isn't T-Rex. These are the ancestors of T-Rex. Uh, so here's just a small sample of the tyrannosaur teeth that we've collected. We do have <laughs> quite a lot more uh, still waiting to be cleaned up. Um, so this is one of the highest concentrations I've ever seen of tyrannosaur teeth within a duckbill bone bed. Um, so this indicates that the, these dead animals were really being uh, eaten quite intensely by multiple individuals of large tyrannosaurs. Uh, so that was my hadrosaur fun. And while we were digging this uh, really awesome hadrosaur bone bed that I was so excited about, Denver had to go and dig up something even more exciting that made us all very jealous. So we'll switch back to him now. Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Denver's Tyrannosaur first. That, uh, so our second big dig, Denver's Tyrannosaur, this is a site that we found in 2018. Now, the brown bones that you can see in this image are just what we think is inside the block. But in 2018, I basically found a, a foot of a Tyrannosaur sticking out of the cliff. And um, 
uh, sorry, in 2017 I found that. And then in 2018 we went back with an excavation permit and we dug in and it looked like it turned into a whole skeleton. Now it was in a big concretion, so it's very difficult to extract, um, but some of the bones around the edges, the ones that you can see the outlines of in this image, they were um, preserved in softer sandstone, so we removed those in jackets. Um, so this is kind of what the site looked like in 2018. Once we removed all of these loose bones, um, we undercut the concretion um, so that we can get it out uh, with a helicopter. So that basically puts us where we were this year. This year we went back there and got this thing ready to helicopter out because, um, well, um, get ready to helicopter it out. Um, and we had our lifting frame ready to go as well. So this is uh, just, this has been built by one of our, um, our board president, Tyler Shock. So he welded this giant lifting frame so that we can attach that to the concretion and then uh, airlift it out. However, unfortunately this year, um, all the helicopter, the heavy lifting helicopters are being used and they're probably still being used uh, to fight fires in California. So we're not able to airlift out that Tyrannosaur. Um, if you've been following a lot of what we've been saying on social media, you'll see that um, we've been talking about this Tyrannosaur a bit. Um, but this one on the left, this is a picture of a similar looking specimen, a beautiful classic specimen um, that's on display at the Tyrrell Museum in uh, Alberta. And I'll just skip back a little bit. Ours, I, I really think it's going to look like that. It's going to look beautiful. Um, the bones are beautifully preserved. Um, I'll show you a few more of them in a bit. Um, we just want to get that block lifted out and in the lab so we can have it prepped. Um, since this time, we've actually removed a couple of the concreted parts that were sticking out. So the block that's left is really, um, it's really just a big lump. You can't see anything in it at all. Um, so this is some of what we've been cleaning up in the lab from that specimen. You can see this is the middle third of the tail. We also have the base of the tail. Um, that's in a concretion, so we're going to prep that out. D uh, Dara uh, finished this tail, so you can come and see it. It's on display at the feet of one of our casts in the main exhibit. Um, Destiny's been working on the belly ribs. We have 39 of the belly ribs of this thing um, that we saw in the field, and Destiny's been cleaning them up. They're in sections because they were taken out in sections. Um, we have a beautiful shoulder blade and a beautiful perfect wishbone. Um, when this thing died, it probably filled up with gas as it rotted, and then its belly burst. So all its belly ribs got scattered, and one of its arms got blown off as well. Uh, so a pretty, pretty, pretty wild uh, death this thing had. And then the foot claw. So some of the first things that we found of this of this specimen were the feet. So we have all sorts of claws and toe bones from the feet. Um, so we're busy cleaning those ones up as well in the lab. Um, but the main body part is still out there in the field. So that's going to be a hopefully a fabulous world class specimen uh, here in Dickinson. Um, we're hoping to fly that out in the spring um, when these forest fires have ended. Uh, so this brings us on to my last of the digs that I'm going to talk about today, Big Dig 3, Jack's B2. So, um, yes, while Liz was digging at the Bighorn Bone Bed, um, I had a small crew working at Jack's B2. So what's Jack's B2? Well, it's named after B-Rex, which is a tyrannosaur found by the Museum of the Rockies, uh, by Bob Harmon at the Museum of the Rockies back in the 1990s, I think, or maybe in 2000. Um, and it had a huge cliff of rock above it. Um, in 2017, we were exploring in this area of the Judith River, and we found, um, uh, Jack Wilson found some vertebrae and some other bones. So this, on the right-hand side, you can see, this is what we call the neural spine, the top of a vertebra from a tyrannosaur. Um, most of the vertebrae were all um, powder, they were ruined, um, they'd been very weathered, um, so they weren't very good. But sticking out of the cliff was... Um, part of a premaxilla and we dug it out and this is what we had. So the premaxilla is the tip of the snout of a tyrannosaur. So even though the cliff was really high this looked like a very promising site to dig in and see if there was any more of it. So we applied for an excavation permit and we went back this year and took a look. So this is what it looked like in 2020. This boulder here, this is where um, the first premaxilla was. 
well, I said the premaxilla was, yeah, giving, away, giving that away. But uh, um, So we put that rock there to mark the spot. And Jack went back uh, to check this site before we started to do any digging, and he saw a little black spot on the uh, sticking out of the cliff, right next to where the premaxilla had been collected. And we looked, and you can see the serrations on this thing. This is a little tyrannosaur tooth sticking out of the cliff. And because it has a flat back part to it, that tells us that this is a tooth from a premaxilla. So we were very excited at this. Jack came back and said, ah, oh, there's a premax tooth sticking out. We've got to dig it out. Um, so it's possible, maybe this is a premaxillary tooth from that other premaxilla that we collected last year. Well, Jack started digging in um, and while Jack was digging this out, me and Josh and and, uh, and Bobby, I think, um, were cleaning up some, some other bones sticking out to the right of this photograph. So Jack's digging in, and, well, here's that tip of the tooth, and it's sticking out of a bone. So it's not just a tooth on its own. And in fact, this turned out to be uh, the other premaxilla from the other side of the tip of the snout. So there's the tooth that Jack saw sticking out of the cliff. This is the cliff edge here. And then here's the rest of the premaxilla. Now if I just spin this picture around a bit, you can see what we're looking at. So here's that premax. This uh, space here is the nostril of the, of the tyrannosaur. And one of the teeth is, is almost fallen out of its sockets, and all the other ones are fallen out of their sockets. There's actually one very, very deep in a socket that we saw when this thing was cleaned up back in the lab. So, so while uh, Jack was collecting this, like I say, me and Josh were busy exposing some bones to the right. And these bones had been very badly weathered on one side, or at least two of them had, and they were very powdery. So we built a little... Um, um, we, we solidified the bones using lots and lots of glue, and then we flipped them out of their position. And this is what one of the first ones flipped out looked like. On the other side of this bone, it's all powdery, the other side that you can't see. But this side is really nicely preserved. And I just went, wow. When I saw this, I was like, whoa, this is a great bone to find. This is the lacrimal horn from the skull. So just in front of the eyes, so the eye would be here, there is a little bump um, in these uh, tyrannosaurs. Um, and it's actually a really important bone to find because the size of these bumps um, tells you the species, or tells you the genus at least. And this tells us right away we're dealing with Dyspletosaurus. So this is a Dyspletosaurus. So we were, I was super excited because this could have been a rib. It looked like nothing on the other side. It was just powder, like I say. Um, so we kept digging, uh, removing the soft sand around where this lacrimal was. Uh, Josh actually did most of this, and uh, he just turned up loads more bones. Um, he had a quadratigugal. These are all skull bones. Post-orbital, this is the one that sits above the eye. A quadrate, uh, contacting the lower jaw. This is a jugal, that's the cheekbone of a tyrannosaur. And then a squamosal, this one I actually found. Uh, Josh found all the others. Um, this one is from the, the, sort of the top part near the brain case. So if I put those onto our diagram, this was super exciting because we haven't even started really digging at this site yet. Like We were planning on spending a month doing overbird and digging away the cliff. These were bones that were in the loose rock on the edge of the cliff uh, that we had to remove before we did a full excavation. So just looking at this, we thought, wow, we, we could almost reconstruct a skull based on just the stuff that we found sticking out the edge of the site. I mean, what else are we going to find inside of this site? Um, so, oh, like I said, the lacrimal, the little horn part of the lacrimal, and then the inflation, the sort of bulbous, rounded shape of the post-orbital, tells us that this is a Dyspletosaurus, or a very close relative. So, uh, this is um, another of the bones that was exposed on the surface. You can see there's lots of uh, sort of rough, damaged bone here. This is... Um, these are the hips, if you like. This is the sacrum. So these are the backbones that fuse in the hip region of the dinosaur. And these little fragments of bone are parts of the sacrum that had been weathered and damaged by modern weathering. Just behind it, there was a few inches of sand covering the other bones. And so these are skull bones, uh, those skull bones that I just told you about. So we had the hips. Nearby, there were two or three tail vertebrae. And then we also had these other skull bones. Unfortunately, just to the left of this photograph um, was the edge of the cliff. 
So there was actually a big space where maybe some of the other skull bones had been. So I expect we've probably lost quite a few. Um, but once we removed these bones, we were able to actually dig in and do some overburden. So we spent the next two weeks removing 20 feet of solid rock from above the bone layer. We didn't know if there was going to be anything in this bone layer, but given we'd done pretty well already, we figured it was probably worth trying. So here in the foreground, you can see Josh shoveling away some of the loose rock that Bobby, who's in the background, is using a jackhammer uh, to loosen up the rock. And then wearing the brightly colored shirt is Brian. Uh, he was another one of our field crew this year. So we spent about two weeks doing this. Um, and we ended up basically exposing a decent amount of bone layer. Not huge. It was about eight feet deep and about uh, 15 feet wide, something like that. Um, and here we are digging in uh, to the bone layer. So how did we do? Well, we found a few bones. It wasn't as rich as we'd like, perhaps. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a rib. We had a couple of ribs. Uh, this one's quite complete. Um, just near to where that Premax came out, uh, we found a tooth and it's got a big long root on it. This is another premaxillary tooth. So this is a tooth that's fallen out of one of those uh, snout bones of the Tyrannosaur. And then um, I found this one here. Um, this is a vertebra. So this is a neck bone, uh, we think, or possibly from the very first part of the back. Uh, we found uh, three or four neck bones and a couple from possibly from the back. Uh, vertebrae and then to the left of that is the splenial so this is a long flat bone that fits on the inside of the lower jaw um, so we were pretty pleased with these um, and as I was digging around this vertebra uh, Josh found a bone and he started cleaning it up and then he calls me over and he says I think there's a tooth here and there was and uh, so Josh continued working on his bone with a tooth sticking out the end and uh, it turned out pretty nice. He's sitting there digging this up, and all I can hear is this very low sort of giggling. He's sort of going, <laughs> and uh, and uh, who can blame him? This turned out rather nice. Um, so this is a dentary. This is the lower jaw of a tyrannosaur. This is the right dentary, so the right lower jaw, and it's full of teeth. Uh, you never get bored of looking at this thing. Um, so here's a close-up of the teeth. Um, they really are very beautiful. Um, when, we were, when we were digging this up, the crew came over from the bighorn bone bed and they wanted to see this jaw before we jacketed it because we don't leave them exposed. We don't leave these bones exposed for very long at all. This, this jaw was only exposed for about 24 hours, um, which gave us time to clean it up, dig around it, jacket it, and get it out safe so that it wasn't uh, going to get exposed to rain or anything like that. Um, so when the other crew came over the next morning to see this thing, um, I'd been digging just next to it, and um, I found some more teeth. And so this is another jaw, but this is the upper jaw. This is called the maxilla. So this is also from the right side of the skull, and it's full of these beautiful teeth. And so you never get bored of looking at them. They're shiny, um, just beautiful, beautiful things to look at. Um, so this is a rather special moment. I don't, I don't think I've ever dug up something quite so pretty as this before. Um, so if we fill in our skull, this is kind of what we've got of this specimen already. We have the upper jaw, we have the lower jaw, we have most of the area of the side of the skull, around the back of the skull. We're still missing the area over the nose. This is called the nasals. And uh, this tends to get very rough and pitted in tyrannosaurs. Uh, we're also missing the brain case. We don't have anything really from the midline top of the skull. Uh, but we've got lots of the sides. We could reconstruct the skull as it already is. And we will be doing so um, probably in a year or two's time. Um, but this is a really promising site, a really big tyrannosaur. So we're going to go back in 20, uh, 2021 next year and dig in even more. We're going to take that cliff back even further and see if we can find more of this skeleton. So right now we don't have all that much of the skeleton, but we do have, um, frankly, we have the best parts of the skull. We have the diagnostic parts of the skull that tell us what species it is. Uh, we'd like to find a little bit more, though. So uh, we're going to be digging in next year. Like I say, we'll probably spend a whole month taking that cliff down another 20, 30 feet. Um, by which point, I don't think we'll be able to take it back any further. Oh, 
And if you look very carefully on this, you can see we've got one toe bone. So this thing at least had feet when it was buried. Um, yeah, so I usually end my talk with photographs of the animals that we saw during the field season. So uh, we saw lots of baby toads, uh, not quite as many as we saw last year, but uh, they all have names. You'll have to ask uh, Savannah what their names are. And all the rabbits have names as well. And uh, early in the season, we had this little uh, shrike who would come by our sites, uh, who would come by our campsite. Uh, he looks very pretty, but uh, he was he was eating maggots from um, dead baby swallows that had fallen out of their nests nearby where we were camping. So uh, he looks all cuddly, but he's he's got quite a horrible habit. And then this is uh, one of the owls that was nesting near camp. Uh, this is a baby owl. Um, so um, before we move on to the live section, I just want to promote the museum a little bit more. If you're interested in becoming a museum member, maybe you live locally, um, you get one of these snazzy membership cards which shows off uh, Boban's fabulous model of Tree Rarcuncus. Um, you get various uh, benefits like discount in the shop, invitation to special events, and of course you can come in and uh, look at the fossils, uh, look at the museum exhibits anytime you like. Um, we do take volunteers in the museum, um, so when COVID passes we'll be looking to have more volunteers come work in the lab. We have a few people who, who come in um, but we, we would like to build our volunteer program at the museum a little bit more. Uh, in the bottom right there, you can see Dara. So uh, she's holding up uh, one of the bones that we showed you before, I think, uh, the post-orbital. Um, so if you want to volunteer in the museum, you can email me or email Dara. And you can find those email addresses at dickinsonmuseumcenter.com. Um, or if you want to volunteer in the museum, you know, just showing people around, talking about fossils, if you like doing that kind of thing, uh, we'd love to have you volunteer at the museum. Um, we also take volunteers in the field program. So Steve, you can see on the left, and then Brian in the middle, and then there's Liz on the right. Um, I generally don't advertise too much for volunteers in the field because we tend to fill our field uh, program um, just by people finding us. Um, I'm hoping this coming summer hopefully COVID will be over and we'll be able to have a crew of about 10 people all the way through the summer and we'll be able to get a lot of this digging done because we've got we have many new sites I haven't told you about um, because there didn't seem to be much point because they just a little bit of rocks a bone sticking out of the rock um, but some really promising new sites we'd like to work and of course we're going to keep working the bighorn bone bed and we're going to be digging at Jack's B2 and uh, getting that more of that thing out hopefully as well um, so we've got some really cool things to be digging up in 2021. Uh, and also, again, please consider donating at DickinsonMuseumCenter.com. Um, we've got some really great programs and some really cool specimens. I'd love to give these specimens the exhibits they deserve uh, in our exhibit. Um, so uh, please consider donating uh, online. We have PayPal and uh, various other ways to donate uh, if, you, if you feel inclined to do so. So that just takes me to my final acknowledgement slide. Um, so got a number of people to thank uh, for their assistance. Um, City of Dickinson, obviously, um, who fund who fund the museum. Uh, TC Energy and the Euro and the Bureau of Land Management, um, along with Conoco Phillips, gave us uh, significant grants to fund that helicopter lift uh, that hasn't happened yet. But we're really keen uh, for that to start uh, in spring. Get that helicopter. Uh, going and get that uh, get that dinosaur, that tyrannosaur out of there. Uh, Destiny and Craig and the North Dakota Lignite Council uh, were significant donors to getting that car charger. And then we've had a number of other people put donations in uh, to fund our field work and our exhibits and, and various other programs at the museum. that had a lot of help from different people. Obviously, thank you to all the people who volunteered in our lab uh, to do preparation. And thank you to all the people who um, served on our field crews as volunteers this summer as well. It was a lot of hard work, but I think everyone can agree that we found some really awesome things um, this summer. And thank, thanks all as well to the land access agencies who gave us permits to collect on their land. So that's the Bureau of Reclamation and most in, uh, um, we collected mostly on the Bureau of Land Management and BLM land um, in Glasgow and Haver. Um, so thanks to all the all the people there at those offices who provided us so much support and help um, with our field program. And so um, now I'm going to uh, 
Aaron is going to sit, step up and switch over to our live camera. And if anyone has any questions about some of the things that we found, um, we'll be able to get some out of um, the cabinets and show you what we found. Okay. Hello, welcome, thanks for tuning in. Um, so we're just switching over now from the PowerPoint based part to our little miniature tour of collections here. Um, so Denver will be joining me soon and Denver and I are married so we share germs already and we can take our masks off. So we'll be able to talk a little more normally uh, to you guys. So welcome and uh, I will be keeping an eye on the comment thread if you guys have questions. Uh, coming in. I've really been enjoying the chatter so far. Uh, people are having fun and uh, so am I. <laughs> Thank you for the entertaining comments. Um, so we're going to show you some of the cool fossils that Denver's just been talking about. Here's Denver. Hello. Hi, how you doing? Good. You're going to enjoy reading these comments later. They're fun. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, make, should we switch this camera around so that we can see what we're looking at? Uh, wasn't there a reason you didn't want to do that? Oh, because it mirrors. It doesn't really matter. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to switch this view round, so everything's going to look back to front. All right, well, I'll just... I had it all adjusted. All right. no, that's okay. Um, so uh, if my left eye looks bigger than my right, it's actually my right eye that's bigger than my left. Because um, it's mirrored. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I don't know, do we have any questions or requests? Liz has got them coming um, up on her... Uh, the, so how many feet deep was the Tyrannosaur quarry? The Tyrannosaur, well, we, we, dug, we dug 20 feet down. And then what, like how deep and wide did you dig as well? We dug about 8 feet into the cliff, <laughs> um, and about 15 to 20 feet wide. Um, it was a big hole, it's going to be even bigger this coming year. Um, it took us about two weeks uh, mainly it didn't take us all that long because there was already a big cliff below us that we were working that we could chuck all the rock down. It's not going to be as easy next year because we've filled that hole with rock. So um, it's going to be a bit more work to dig. But yeah, it was a 20 foot deep hole. It, it, was, a lot, it was a lot of work. Bob, Bobby is a demon with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the jackhammer. He called it Sasha. He named our jackhammer. Yeah, normally I'm the one doing the jackhammer and Bobby helps me, but uh, since I was at the bone bed, Bobby had to do all the jackhammering this year, and he really took a shine to it, so thank you for saving my back. So show some fossils. Show some fossils. Yeah. Well, since we were talking about Jack's B2, I should bring out Jack's B2. So, this is the first premaxilla that we found in 2017, the Jack found in 2017. So, you're looking down the snout of a Tyrannosaur right now, um, and this is the whole, um, this is the nostril. This little part had broken off, we actually found another piece to fit on here this year, with a little bit of um, weathering at the site had, uh, had exposed one of the missing pieces that was really annoying me. If you've seen photographs of this online, you won't see this little one fragment. We found it at the site and I glued it on uh, just a few weeks ago. So the other premaxilla to go with it, this is the one that we collected this year with the tooth sticking out. Um, this little process, the nasal process is broken, but that's the premaxilla and if I hold it really close to the camera, I'll figure out where my camera is. Uh, well, it doesn't really focus, but you can't get an appreciation for the level of detail and the quality of preservation on the specimen. You can see uh, not just these big holes, these nerves, where the nerves would go, but you can see really, really tiny pores. The quality of preservation of this site is exquisite. So if I hold these together, I just like to do this. <laughs> this is kind of fun. So. You're looking down the snout of a Tyrannosaur right now, so there's the two premaxes together and its nostrils would be here where my fingers are. So, um, 
We don't have the maxilla and the dentary cleaned yet, so I can't show you those. Um, but when we get them clean, we will put photographs on our social media. Um, this is a pretty big individual. Um, I can show you uh, another specimen. So, let's see. This is a pre-maxilla from another Tyrannosaur. We haven't dug this site yet. Uh, this is called uh, Jack's Tyranno. Um, and I am holding them up next to each other. So, um, this one is about medium-sized, if you like. And this one is pretty big, so B2 is about... Um, it's the size of a small T-Rex. I imagine the skull would be probably maybe a, almost a meter long, perhaps. Um, this one would have a much smaller skull. And the articulated specimen that we're collecting is a quite small Displetosaurus. Uh, if we, if it, we don't actually know if that one's a Displetosaurus or not, but it is a Tyrannosaur. That one would be um, probably about half the size of B2. So hopefully uh, give us a couple of years to get these things out and a bit more cleaned up. Um, but I'm hoping that we'll have a half size Displetosaurus articulated on display, just like the Tyrrell have got, and then a full-sized B2 skull reconstruction, and who knows, if we find more of the skeleton, maybe we can do something with that too. And then this site, um, Jack's Tyranno, is one that we will work in the future. Um, there's more skull. There's, it, it's a bit exploded, and it's a bit of a weird site to get to, um, but it's another uh, Tyrannosaur site with cranial material coming out. Skull material. So a couple of questions came in about uh, B2. Um, before you put away that one with the premax tooth, uh, they wanted to know, is it really that big or has some has it slipped out? Like, are we seeing a bit of root? Um. Um, well, you know, that's something that people have debated a little bit. There is definitely a little bit of root here. Um, the lighting's not brilliant, but... Um, yeah, I can kind of... This is kind of the boundary between the crown and the root. Yeah, this is kind of the boundary of the crown and the root. So the crown is, is this big, and so that would have been projecting about out of the gum, the gum line of the Tyrannosaur. If you look down into the sockets, you know, the lighting is not ideal. Um, well, you can't see any teeth in there, but you can in the other one. Um, but it's not, it's not out too far. If I hold it this way around, you can usually tell um, the base of the crown, because the crown is enamel, and then the root, I think, is just made of dentine. It's not as shiny. And so this sort of line here where my finger is, is the edge of the shiny, if you like. So the gum would have been this part here. So these are some of the first bones that have been cleaned up from B2. The other ones, uh, Denver showed you field photos, but they haven't been cleaned up yet. So it seems to be some sort of Displetosaurus, but we can't give it uh, any better species ID yet. Uh, we'll have to wait and see after those bones are cleaned up. So here's, here's, a, here's a bone. This is from uh, Jack's Tyranno. to not B2, different one. This is the lacrimal of Jack's Tyranno. So when this was found it was exploded all over the surface and you can see there's lots of cracks in it and I had to sit and puzzle this together and I got quite a lot of it together but it's what we call inflated. So it's bulbous, it's rounded and uh, what's really cool about it is it was full of air. So these, these lacrimal horns on a, on a Tyrannosaurus skull were, 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 have big air spaces inside of them. And so we can look at this lacrimal horn and tell that this is from a uh, Displetosaurus. So, um, yeah, this is the third Displetosaur site that we're working or planning on working. We've got a geology question. Oh no, geology question. Okay, what geology question have we got? Uh, so Dave Fuquay wanted to know a bit more about why we have so much Judith River and Hell Creek formation, but like not much Fox Hills. And why don't we have many fossils from the Fox Hills formation? So things in between the Judith River and Hell Creek. Where are the dinosaurs? Um, so at the end of Judith River time, sea level rises again and uh, we get what's called the bare pore shale. Now that, that interior seaway that I showed in one of the slides, um, sea level rises and falls and the sea sometimes pushes up all the way as far as the Rocky Mountains 
um, and other times it recedes um, quite quite a long way back to the eastern side of Montana and then at the very end of the age of dinosaurs the sea receded all the way to the eastern side of North Dakota and so that's when we have the Hell Creek formation from about uh, 66, 67 million years ago so we can find dinosaurs in North Dakota. Before that time there was only marine rocks um, in North Dakota. So you don't find many dinosaurs between the Judith River and the uh, Hell Creek because for most of Montana and most of North Dakota you've got marine rocks. You can find dinosaurs in marine rocks because uh, you know their carcasses wash out to sea and sometimes sink and get buried at the bottom of the sea. Uh, but they're not very common. Um, and you know the, the head is usually quite loose and can fall off quite easily and that's the one the part that you need to tell what species you've got so um, you don't find that many um, skulls in those marine rocks um, there are some inland deposits if you like from around about that time uh, the St. Mary River formation um, and some of the other units uh, right up in the mountains in western Montana and western parts of um, Alberta, I believe, uh, possibly British Columbia as well, where you can get some of these intermediate age uh, dinosaurs. And also if you go down to the southwest, there's also some units there as well. I could just list them all, but then it would just be a list. And that would be boring. <laughs> um, so this room, we mainly have most of the Tyrannosaur material in here. Uh, we have another collections room where we have most of the bighorn bone bed material being put. Uh, because we have so much of it, it's already filling cabinets and we're only just getting started. Um, so someone was wondering how big is that the horn from above it? This, this is the nose horn from um, Liz Centro 2. So this is a Centrosaurus nose horn from, um, from Liz Centro 2. So that's what that is. Um, See, he, he can't let me talk about hadrosaurs that long. He's so obsessed with the horned dinosaurs. Um, but the, the bighorn bone bed, it's, it's a fantastic site. It is much bigger than what we've dug so far. Uh, we could easily go 10 meters left, 10 or 20 meters right, um, 5 to 15 meters back. And that's all without having to do the jackhammering overburden. So... It's just a gorgeous sight. We can dig there for years, finding juvenile skull bones and, and not have to break out the jackhammers. So we will be working on that one for a very long time. I had it up there. Oh, yeah. So this is that little jaw that I was uh, showing a picture of. So this is a, a lower jaw from a young, um, probably Centrosaurus, I think. A uh, young Ceratopsian. Bobby Bobby Ebelha cleaned this up for us just a few weeks ago. Um, so I've got that one ready. In the, the part of the Judith River that we're digging, um, people are wondering what the most common dinosaurs are. Normally the herbivores are going to be the most common animals that you find. Um, and so Typically in the Judith River, at least in Montana, that's going to be hadrosaurs. Uh, so the duckbill dinosaurs tend to be a lot more common than the horned dinosaurs. And that's, that's what we're seeing in the areas where, uh, where we're digging where the tyrannosaurs are. But the tyrannosaurs there are so common. Uh, also, we've just been having really good luck with all those tyrannosaurs. Yeah, I think we were just very lucky that... Uh... The Jack Wilson came out with us and found us a few Tyrannosaurs. Um, but there were also some Tyrannosaurs to find. Um, it's a bit crazy in that area, actually. We've, we've got a few, that, few sites we still need to collect. Um, but uh, it's not normal to find this many Tyrannosaur sites. I think we've just been very fortunate. There are quite a lot of duckbills as well in these, these hard concretions, but they're very difficult to extract. Um, and you really need a skull if you're collecting a duckbill to be able to figure out what species you've got. And we haven't yet found a concretion with an obvious skull in it. We think we might have one, um, but um, that's a story for another time. But, uh, what other questions do we have? Uh, someone was wondering what the blue filler was. Oh, um, well the, fil the filler on that jaw 
The bluish color is just paint. Um, it's been filled in with um, marble powder mixed into a glue that dissolves in acetone. Paraloid. Paraloid. So it's a thick paraloid mix that's been filled in um, with marble powder, which is powdered marble, um, which gives it a white base. Um, we're sort of experimenting with the way that we color the infill. So this one is just painted. Um, we can f color the marble powder as well and try and do it that way. Um, we're sort of figuring out what the best way to do that is at the moment. Yeah, but having this marble powder mixed in, um, in the paraloid is really nice because it's reversible. If we ever do want to take it apart again, uh, it won't hurt the fossil at all. There's that little frill. More horned dinosaurs. Yeah, cute, cute little frill. It is, I, it is cute. I like the horned dinosaurs, and, and Liz got all these duck bills, and I had to put up with all these tyrannosaurs this summer. I, I, I gotta have some. Do you wanna show them how to Um, Yeah, if you've uh, joined us for past field reports, you've seen one of the duck bill dinosaur tails uh, that we've talked about. Um, so it's a pathologic tail, which means that it was broken and then the broken bones healed while the animal was, was still alive. So, you know. I can bring the camera over. Do you want me to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's nicer seeing them all lying, lying yeah. down in the, in the tray. Yeah, let's bring the camera over. Um, so, gotten them puzzled back together pretty well. I'll bring the... Out. I don't know if it's seeing it. There you go. A little more. I can just, I'll, I'll just mirror it and spin it around. Okay, whatever you like. I'll just uh, spin this around. Hang on. So th these are pathological vertebrae because they've been broken and then healed. So let me show you what they're supposed to look like. At least a little bit. Um, Now, I haven't glued all the pieces on because sometimes it's nice to be able to see inside the bone. So this one's not too badly damaged. It's a fairly straight spine that you see here. Um, so it's a, it's a little wavy. It's not completely straight. And there is some funny texture on the surface of the bone. Um, but typ you know, typically that's what it should look like. Okay, so that one's not too badly deformed. Um, then we get into some that are getting more wavy. I don't know. Oh, so you are moving up. Okay. Um, so this one, starting to see a little more waviness, some weird texture, some random holes for blood vessels and such. Um, but still, not too bad on this one. There's so many of them now, they barely fit in the drawer. All right, then we can get into some more badly damaged ones. So this one here, so this, the bone broke about right here, and then it's healed. And so when a bone is healing, it forms this callus around the injury. And so there's um, cartilage, and then it becomes bone. There's a lot of blood supply. And so there's these cells constantly working to remodel and fix the bone. But because dinosaurs didn't have doctors and couldn't properly set the bone, uh, it remained a little wonky. Um, so you can really see a lot more of the curve in this one that's been left behind. And then some of the worst parts of this poor fellow actually aren't curved because this broke in a slightly different way. So this one, you can see this V shape here. And so in this one, the top, this is the top piece of the bone. You can see that really obvious area that doesn't belong. So the top part of the bone, something smacked it from straight above and it split. And so you had this V-shaped split that jammed it down lower onto the existing bone. So, you know, this bone was here, this part belonged higher up and it split and crashed down on top of this. Uh, so really painful, uh, nasty injury. So we have a whole series of these vertebrae um, all 
all coming together. Yeah, this is a site that we collected um, mostly last year and the year before. We had a few more fragments we collected from it this year. Um, as you can see, Liz has been piecing this together and uh, we had a few fragments that helped finish some of these vertebrae off. Um, there was probably more of this skeleton originally. It was one of these um, hadrosaurs that was preserved in a sandstone concretion. But most of the bones were very powdery and damaged. And um, it just so happened that we collected the neural spines, these spines sticking up from the vertebrae. They're upside down in your photograph, in the, in the image. Um, but um, these spines, and we just saw this injury and just thought, wow, this is a special specimen. So we've been working hard to get this one together. And this one will be on display in the museum fairly soon. I've got a case uh, pretty much ready for it. So um, Liz just has to do some finishing touches, I think, to the pieces that fit together. Okay, I'll put this camera back to this way around, and uh, if anybody has any more questions or other specimens to look at. Um, not, not particularly. Um, that's, uh, that's mostly it. I mean, you can show off some Tyrannosaur teeth. That's always popular. <laughs> You can never show it on Tyrannosaurus teeth, right? Well... Oh, I got the little horn. That's pretty cool. Here's the little horn. I haven't fully glued it together because we're hoping we might find one of the missing pieces. This is the little baby brow horn from a little chasmosaurine, probably a little, a little long-horned horned dinosaur. So he's just a little baby. So I was very pleased when we found this. A real cutie. And there, there it is. If I just hold it that way around, you can sort of see it better. It's very small. Um, uh, another comment about those, those pathologic hadrosaur vertebrae. Um, saying they look in pretty good shape, even considering the pathologies. You don't know what they looked like before, okay? So they started out in a million pieces. Uh, so I still have a few pieces I haven't managed to get back together, but those vertebrae were collected in gallon Ziploc bags, probably 10 or 12 different gallon Ziploc bags uh, and then the pieces were washed and put into uh, six different trays like this overflowing with fragments. So it was an interesting jigsaw puzzle um, but actually not, not too bad. I'm almost done. There's a few more pieces I'm still working on uh, puzzling back together. Um, but yeah, that was a jigsaw puzzle. So I, I was really happy when they started coming together. Uh, how many complete ones we were able to get back together. Um, but yeah, typically when we're looking at uh, the you know, people who are still curious about what, what are the most common dinosaurs, um, Denver's looking through these microsites. And so microsites are great for sampling uh, the whole environment and all the different species that were living there. And so what we find in the microsites matches up pretty well with what we find in the big bones. So there's Tyrannosaur teeth. Yep, these are mostly Tyrannosaur teeth. I think there's one little uh, raptor tooth just there. Um, but these are mostly Tyrannosaur teeth. Yeah, and as far as the herbivore teeth go, uh, we mainly find duckbill dinosaur teeth a lot more commonly than we find the uh, ceratopsian teeth. So what we see in the tooth record in these small accumulations matches up with what we see uh, with our big sites. Um, we do have some less common ones turn up. There's ankylosaurs. Um, there's, uh, well, other things like turtles and alligators and champsosaurs, which are like alligators, but not alligators. <laughs> uh, and... Um, there's a cute little little hadrosaur frontal for Joshua. Cute little guy. So this is the uh, midline suture here right at the top of the skull. Um, there's the 
top view. This is where the eye would go. This is the, the orbital margin here. And then inside, that little depression is for part of the brain. Right there. That's a, a really cute one. The sutures on this are very nicely preserved. This is from quite a small uh, individual. The whole skull would be maybe you know, that big. Um, really cute little guy, less than a year old. Uh, absolutely adorable. Want some more adorable hydrosol bits? I can never have too many adorable hydrosol bits. Oh, I think it's quite a big one. There's that little jaw. Got a really nice gnarly toe bone here. It's missing a bit of the tip. It would be a little more pointed, uh, but this is from one of the, the Ornithischian dinosaurs. So this is, would you call this Anki? I think it probably is. Yeah, this is most likely from an Ankylosaur. Just sideways. Um, so it's kind of a, a hoof. So there's your proximal articulation with the hand or foot. Um, this seems like more of a hand. And then there's the front end, a little broken, but very gnarly looking, which we see on a lot of ankylosaur material. They were weird, crusty creatures. One of the nice things about some of what we found with the hadrosaurs is um, there are actually quite a lot of remains of very small ones. Small hadrosaurs. I'm looking specifically for that little maxilla. I don't know, but I'm going to play with the brain case. Okay. Try Here. Sorry. Um, this, I want to be careful with it. it yeah, it's glued together. Okay. Uh, this is a piece of brain case from a crocodile. So here's the top view of the skull. So crocodiles have this really rugose texture on the surface. They're really easy to tell croc skull. Um, and then a couple of fenestrae at the top of the skull. These are not the eye sockets, uh, but these are just some holes at the top of the skull. So this is the very back of the brain case um, in here. You can see the occipital condyle from the back. Okay, there's the occipital condyle where the first vertebra attaches, and then the neural canal where the... Um, or frame and magnum on the skull, uh, where the brain stem would come out and join the spinal cord. Okay. That one. Oh. Let's see if there's any new comments? Any questions? <laughs> uh, people are just uh, feeling my pain on, on putting back, on puzzling back together all those tail vertebrae. Um, yeah. yeah, there's lots of nice things in all these microsites. I mean, um, yeah. we have some ankylosaur fans, and it's not just Bobby. You see any more Anki stuff? It's part of a, part of a shoulder spike. Ooh, that is a nice one. Uh, so here's one of the scoots from an ankylosaur. So it almost looks like a ceratopsian nose horn, doesn't it? Um, but it has, again, that really kind of gnarly, weird surface texture. Here's top view. Um, so this is a very pointed piece of what's often called armor. Um, so this might be one of the little shoulder spikes. Nice little spike. And these would all be covered... Uh, probably with keratin or skin um, on the surface. You see all those blood vessels. This is very living tissue. Yeah, have a look at that. Um, here's a little baggie of amber. So we do find quite a bit of amber uh, at a lot of these sites, sometimes in the quarries where we're digging, sometimes uh, in the microsites. Um, and very often the amber in the Judith River Formation is not well preserved, and it just pulverizes. Um, but we've, we've started having better luck really keeping some of the pieces intact. Um, so we're working with someone up in Saskatchewan who's looking for little teeny tiny insects in these guys. Yeah, there's an old with the hand claw. Oh, this is, this is pretty. 
So here's a hand claw of an ornithomimid. These are those ostrich mimic dinosaurs. So they don't have teeth, which means we can't find their teeth in microsites, but we do often find uh, their claws and vertebrae and things. So you can look how long and slender, very skinny claw that is. So that would not be good for walking. This is not a foot claw. Uh, this is a hand claw. Here is a foot claw. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah, is, now we can see the, the difference. So here's a foot claw. You see it's a lot more stout. Um, it's wider. We have a good flat base on the bottom for contacting the substrate that it's walking on. Nice groove in the side there for the blood. Uh, so again, this would be covered with keratin. It would be pointier in life, and that blood groove there is going to keep that keratin uh, supplied with nutrients. There, there are so many treasures in all of these drawers of, of microfossils. I mean, we call them microsites, and usually you call it a microsite when the fossils are very, very small. Most of the fossils actually at these sites uh, are probably a centimeter or larger. Um, so you, you, you get all sorts of things. You get toe bones and little teeth and bits of turtle. Um, and we're really starting to just um, figure out um, this area and the fauna of the animals that lived in it. Uh, we had a question about the, the amber. There's three different Joshua's, com Joshua's commenting on here, so um, I'm just blanket Joshua's. Um, wanted to know if, if anybody's found any inclusions or bugs in the amber yet. Um, from one of the sites that we collected the most amber from, there has been some insect parts found in some of the amber. Um, I haven't heard anything. Like, like a little gnat or something? Yeah, something like a little gnat or something, but they're very hopeful that they'll find more. Here you go, Liz, you'll like this one. Okay. All right, so we got a few different little goodies in here. Here, we'll start with the most obvious one. Uh, here's a tail vertebra from a uh, hadrosaur, and the neural spine... Okay, you can see the rows, those are tooth rows. This is a teeny tiny little maxilla, uh, one of the upper jaw bones of a duckbill dinosaur. Um, so you can see the tooth rows there. It's, it's broken in half, so it would be about twice as long, um, which means its maxilla would be um, just a little bigger than my maxilla. This, this is really an adorable little fellow here. Um, so we do find evidence of quite small and young uh, duck bills in, in this area, um, which is pretty exciting. How long did you want to go on? It's uh, 7.30. If there's questions, otherwise, um, if you think there's anything else people might want to look at. Do you guys have any more last minute questions for us? Any other requests for show and tell? Um, I'll give you a few minutes to get your, your last minute questions in. I quite like doing these kinds of things anyway because they don't involve me editing the videos. So if people want to, uh, <laughs> if I do a few more of these kinds of things in the future, we can look at some more of the fossils. <clears throat> yeah, we do these live videos once in a while whenever Denver has some interesting little project going on. So stay tuned for other things. Yeah, thanks for, for joining us. Uh, we've had a good crowd here live, um, carrying about 40 people most of the time, and I know it's late in a lot of countries, so more people will probably watch the recording tomorrow. So, hello. Um. Yeah, yeah, so uh, thanks for tuning in, and um, but, uh, yeah, keep keep tuned to uh, what we're doing here at the museum. We'll, we always post stuff on social media pretty regularly, photographs and new things being prepped. And uh, obviously we've got some exciting things to come for the, the next year. So uh, everybody stay safe and uh, we will uh, see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Mask up again. <laughs> I've gotten really used to this mask. I wear it almost all day while I'm teaching. So don't even notice it anymore. So I'm going to finish this stream.